Okay. I think we're going to, we are going to get started here. Um, all right, here we go. Um, hi everyone. My name is Joey Katz. I'm the program associate with Boston Jewish film. And thank you so much for joining us on our last program of the day. Um, we have had a literary themed day of programming here at Boston Jewish film. Uh, we had a Q and a earlier today for, um, who will remain. Where we talked about uh, the Yiddish poet Abraham Sutzkever, which was very enlightening, very fun. Um, so we're ending the day here with a equally riveting and interesting conversation here about uh, the author Saul Bellow. Um, before I get into our introductions here, I am just going to let you know that everyone who has attended um, and registered for this event and the Who Will Remain event is. Uh, eligible for a 20% discount for all uh, new books, as well as a curated selection of books by uh, Jewish authors um, that our friends at the Brookline Booksmith have curated for us. So we're very happy to be partnering with them on this. Um, so yeah, there will be information on that in the chat. Um, but without further ado, I'd love to welcome uh, our special guests for today. Uh, we have the director of The Adventures of Saul Bellow, Asaf Kale. How are you? Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Great to see you face to face. And we have um, our moderator, Professor Sal Zaret. How are you? Hi, doing well. Great. Um, so I'm just going to read some quick bios here uh, about our guests today, uh, and then I'm going to hand it over to uh, Asaf and Saul. So, Asaf Galei um, uses the documentary medium to rethink Jewish and Israeli relationships with modern culture. His recent films include Army of Lovers in the Holy Land, which follows a Swedish pop singer from a sexually provocative art to his decision to move to Israel, the Hebrew superhero, which examines the development of comic books in Israel, and the muses of Isaac Beshevis uh, Singer, um, which we actually screened in 2017. So this is not our first Asaf film here, and we're happy to have you back. Um, Galea has also, uh, is currently in production for a film called Cartooning America, about the Jewish cartoonist who brought us Betty Boop. So looking forward to seeing that when that uh, hopefully rolls on into uh, uh, Boston Jewish film uh, in the future. Um, and Saul Zaret uh, is an associate professor of Yiddish literature in the departments of comparative literature and Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at Harvard University. He is the author of Jewish American Writing and World Literature, which came out last year, and is a founding member of Ingeveb, I hope I said that right, which is a journal, uh, great, a journal of Yiddish studies. So very much looking forward to today's conversation, and I will hand it over to you guys. Great, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Joey. Uh, I'm really excited to have this film at the festival, um, having been involved sort of uh, from the beginning on the advisory board. So it's exciting to see this project after a long time make its way uh, to, to the, the feature film that, that, that all of you got to see. Um, I think it's a particularly challenging topic, Saul Bello, whose you know, biography is long and complicated. After all, Zachary Leader, one of the talking heads in the film, wrote a two volume, I think thousands of pages worth of biography. So to fit that into, I think an hour and 20 minutes or whatever it is, um, is, is a tall task. Um, but because we're, this is a Jewish film festival, I'll start off with a, a question that has to do with Jewishness. Uh, Bello famously uh, really hated being called a Jewish writer, especially when he was lumped in with uh, Bernard Malamud and with, uh, with Philip Roth. He thought that there was like calling them a kind of like a manufacturing business, a PR business for Jewish, the Jewish community. And he didn't want to have any, any part of it. He rather wanted to be a writer first and foremost, uh, an artist, maybe even an American writer before he would be a Jewish writer. Um, but at the same time, his characters are all very noticeably and very obviously Jewish you know, whether autobiographical or otherwise, as being descendant of Jewish immigrants in particular, that kind of what he calls his potato love has to do with a kind of Jewish sentimentality that he emphasizes in a lot of his films. So it's a really sort of complicated thing to deal with. What, what do you make then of your film being featured at Jewish Film Festival? I'm sure it's been at other Jewish film festivals as well. What, what would Bellow have made of that fact in, in the first, do you think? And more broadly, 
Um, how did you go about approaching Jewishness, Bellow's Jewishness in the film? Uh, first, I hope that he is happy that the film is in this special place in Boston, because, and uh, I wish that it was in the Coolidge uh, Corner Theater, that it's like five minutes from where he lived in his love last uh, 10 years in uh, Brooklyn, really. So I I think that he would be very happy that it's in this festival near his house and he can come. Uh, the film also was uh, not only in Jewish film festival, it was also in uh, other film festivals, in Buenos Aires, and in Spain. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but still, it's a really good question that also bothered me why he was really upset to be called him and also Philip Roth to be called the Jewish writer. And when you read them, they are so Jewish American writers. So I cannot answer why it was bothered him so much. And of course, uh, he wrote about it, uh, some articles. Sometimes he really... He was, I think that in the end of his life, he understand better this uh, box that he's a Jewish writer and he felt more comfortable with it. But uh, I could uh, hear your voice about it because you also wrote uh, a great uh, analyze of this. Well, well, we'll leave my work out of it for now, but I think <laughs> yeah. it's interesting in the film how that his Jewishness sort of comes up as part of this hybridity that he talks about, right? This, the, the, especially that opening line about from Augie March, I'm an, I'm a, I'm a, now I'm blanking on it. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I'm an American Chicago born, but then immediately as Hannah Worth Nesher explains, the language becomes of the street and becomes very immigrant heavy, even as it's also trying to be the most beautiful and the most uh, sort of jazz like of prose. It's sort of interesting kind of how he himself doesn't always understand where to put it, but it's always there, that kind of thing. Also in the novel film, the dialogue between him and Wavelstein in the book, when he said more like, let's say Jewish philosophy of next life and each person he's is the own unique world and you can, if you destroy one person, you destroy a whole world. Uh, so it seems that he's became more comfortable with his Jewishness. Yeah, I, I think so. And I, I, that brings me to my next question, which has to do with this line, one of the lines that opens the film, which is a very powerful one. Um, it, it's, it's sort of an account of towards the end of his life, Bello was asking, um, was I a man or was I a jerk? Which is such a, such a very Bello-like question. And I, I don't know if it's a very fair one in any way, but for me, this opposition between a man and a jerk gets to a lot of that sort of tension between different kinds of Americanness, between what manliness may mean. Because one of the things I think Zachary Leader says in the film is that man here on the one hand refers to the man or the, the man who defends Western civilization, especially after the 1970s, Bella was part of this sort of neoconservative rear guard trying to defend the Western civilization from these radicals. So that was, that's the kind of man that he wants to be, but it also refers to the idea of being a mensch, this, this idea of being the right kind of person, a nice person, a good person, and on the, on the third side is this idea of being the jerk, which is not very good. It's very bad to be a jerk, but it's also an extraordinarily American word and an American sort of slang word. It's of the street, which is something he was always very attracted to, too. All of the characters that are gangsters are the most colorful and entertaining characters in his novels, and they're jerks. Um, but they're also the people he's obsessed with. Even the main character is often, who's the bellow character, is often a jerk in some way. So that sort of balances between this Jewishness, this Americanness, but also ideas of masculinity and between whether you're a good person or a bad person or both admirable and terrible or bristling self-defensive, but also generous in some ways. So when you were making the film, how did you go about balancing these kind of diverse elements 
in the Bellow character, you know, especially trying to face ideas of misogyny and racism that come up a lot in his work and came up in the film without also at the same time making it too much into a hagiography, sort of a praising of Bellow in some way. How did you balance that kind of the manliness, the jerkness of the Saul Bellow character as you were making the film? Say that I don't make hagiographics uh, yeah, movies. I don't try. Uh, I don't. I think that they are boring. And if I would do it, I think that uh, Sol Bello was very upset <laughs> because he didn't like this kind of uh, movies or books that are just praising and saying everything. He liked this, uh, like uh, Philip Roth. He liked the monstery in the men he was really obsessed with this big monstery personalities uh, and uh, he said uh, I, I that he he when he came to white he, he was always uh, came he was not indifferent he was oh hate or love this is was his motive to white and uh, this is what was the, what he was thinking, hate a lot of time more than love, in my opinion. This is was <laughs> why mm. he was uh, sitting and writing. That, and, uh, uh, there is a nice description when he writes. It's a very physical thing. People think that to be a writer, it's like uh, sitting on the desk and writing like this. But he was writing with all his his body, he was sweating, he was like cursing, like he was running a marathon, <laughs> like he was so these big personalities and punching them and wrestling with them. Uh, I think that uh, this is, was a big motive for him. And also my movies, I, I wrestle with ideas that he said uh, that he is like in a fight with uh, Vivian Ko Gornig, a great uh, feminist uh, scholar, or he's in a fight with uh, the ideas of uh, Charles Johnson, uh, that he's a great writer and, uh, and, uh, and lecturer in uh, Seattle University. So uh, the fighting between the ideas, it's also a very Jewish uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, idea of, from the Talmudic way. So how, how did you get someone like Vivian Gornick to come and do an interview? Because, you know, if writing a film about Saul Bello, his friends are going to be happy to come and give you an interview, right? I'm sure we'll, we can talk, we'll talk about um, Philip Roth in a little bit, but wh what was it like? How, how did you get those people to come say very critical and harsh things about Saul Bello? How did, how did you get them to interview? Were, were they willing or how did you convince them? So Vivian Gorning, she just told me don't, that she never saw ever a good film about a writer, that all the documentary films that she watched were very hagiographic. That the, so I told her, okay, well, you can watch my last film about Isaac Bashevi Zinger and she watched it and she said, okay, so you are not doing this way. So I will come to, to give you an interview. I, uh, and, but know that I'm not going to tell a very nice stories about Sol Bello. And she have also some personal stories about him. And it was, so my earliest work may be convinced her. And Charles Johnson said that Although he said to me, I admire Bellow's writing, but have also very critical things to tell him. And it's very important to me that you will show both of the, my ideas and the him, I'm so happy that you will do it. I'm, I'm glad. And this is uh, how it worked. I mean, yeah, it's, it's strange because, you know, Bellow, what is very critical of his main characters and of all of his characters and works them very hard. But when the Atlas biography came out of, of Bellow, he wasn't happy about it. Also, if people said, gave him negative reviews of his books, he would get very upset. There's people that wrote negative reviews of his books that then, you know, he broke off contact with in some way, but at the same, so he bristled at the same, at the same time that he was someone who was full of critique. So that's why I, I admire this sort of balancing act that you have to do in the film that maybe Bella wouldn't have been happy about, but is in the spirit of Bella's work in some way. This 
is what I feel. Also, you know, it's a, as a director. So when I get critiques, I don't like it. I, don't <laughs> like it. <laughs> I can really understand this, uh, uh, this state of mind. But on the other hand, this is why you try to improve yourself in each film. Like uh, in this film, uh, when I compare it to my film that he did uh, also about the writer Isaac Vashevis Ridway try to correct that will be more readings for his own uh, from his own books like in Isaac Vashevis I just told the story the biography story let's say it or mm -hmm. the story of his translation but there was not a lot of uh, material from his own books and in this book I gave a lot of uh, homage and uh, just to read the sentence, the great sentence from Bell's book. So in each film, you try to, to take the critique and improve yourself. So, so critics is good. It's not <laughs> hard to get, but. So how did you come upon the idea of having, it's sort of like highlighted text uh, as, it, as it went around? Did you get that from other documentaries about writers or it's something you came up with? Because for me, it's very striking because I could tell these are the paper, like Bella was part of the paperback revolution of the post-war period where suddenly you, everyone could read literature on these paperbacks. So for me, it's a very familiar kind of type. You know, you can, you, it's very readable in that sense, but also familiar for a particular time. So how did you come upon that highlighting technique that you do in the film? And it's also the same font. Again, try to, to change also the how the paragraph are printed, it would become so much uh, easier to me <laughs> and, uh, if I could change some of the paragraphs. Uh, but I really stick to it as how people are to give them the feeling of how they read it. Uh, like you said, the, and it's so important because in the end, my film, I want that people will go back and read Bella book. This is what I feel if somebody is telling me I went back and I reread again Herzog, I feel that I succeeded in my movie. I don't, uh, so this is my mission. So I really want to give them back the reading of the books and especially this Bella paragraph that are so beautiful and uh, are amazing. So I, uh, I didn't watch it in other films. Uh, I, usually when people are doing readings in documentary films, they are bringing actors or doing reacting or uh, a lot of things that I critic and dislike. <laughs> so I try to do it very, that the people that read them, the people that are connected to the stories, uh, that they are, their mother or they are in the story and not that I'm bringing a famous uh, actor. First I thought, oh, I will bring David Duchovny to read everything. Uh -huh. And I approached him and he said, yes. But then I said, no, I don't need him. <laughs> <laughs> it will be so awful that he will read it. And, uh, and then if you bring David Duchovny, so you think, okay, when people will read, they will do like a nice shots of uh, the landscape of Chicago, of uh, something that is connected to the paragraph. So, and, uh, and all of these are, uh, are distractions from the words itself. And this is not what I wanted to do. Yeah, it's a particularly powerful way that the sort of the connection between fiction and autobiography comes together in the voices of the characters who are depicted. Right? Mm -hmm. That moment of, you know, the sons reading about sort of very hateful prose about their mothers or the very touching end of, of Janice Bellow reading about herself being portrayed in the novel you know, that she gets emotional about it, but she also then afterwards says she would rather not be in the novel. <laughs> and I think that's a really great, a really great tension between this fiction and the way that he used his fiction, he mined his life sometimes abusively for his fiction, a really powerful way. Yes, uh, I think that uh, his third wife, Susan Glassman, wanted to write uh, uh, a book 
a biography about him that called right, Mugging right. the I, Muse. I, Mugging the Muse. What, say it again? I think that uh, his third wife, Susan Glassman, wanted to write a, a book uh, about her uh, life with Saul Bellows that's called Mugging the Muse. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, there's a there's a certain amount of theft in it, yes. even as it's also a kind of homage. I mean, also a chance to get revenge in some sense. Because yes. um, I'm conscious of time, I want to make sure I get in other questions I want to ask. And I think one of the central characters of the film, though he's not, you know, part of Saul Bellow's biography in that sense, is Philip Roth. You know, a, a increasingly important interview since he, of course, is no longer with us, but. It's also has that amazing coda of the phone ringing. I loved how you included that in the end of the film. It's really, I think, shocking and really poignant as well. So how important was it to get that, uh, how important was it to get that interview? What was that like? Was it, was it hard or was he very willing to talk? And, and um, is there something in that conversation that you didn't get to ask or stuff that got left on the cutting floor that you'd be willing to share with us? The whole Philip Roth interview, I, I'm going to show, to put it as soon in the PBS uh, website, and it will be, and it, and it works like this. I, I could do a film just with this interview. So it started that first, of course, I contact uh, Philip Roth through his agency, the Wiley agency, and of course he said, no, I quit writing. And I, uh, for seven years, I don't want uh, to be <laughs> to get interview. It was always a torture for him. And before, and I, really, I saw that he was always saying the same question, the same answer. Would he? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, he was always saying the same. Uh, Answers, you know, always saying the same stories. Uh, the, the story with the cab driver, driver the Portnoy. He really disliked interviews. Really, compared to Bellows, that he loved to get in, to give interview. In each interview, he give uh, new, new quotes. For him, is like a chess match with, his, and uh, he really wants to win to be the smarter men in the room, uh, so Philip Roth really, so, so I, I wrote him another nudge and I told him, but if it was Bello uh, alive and they would uh, come to him to give interview about Roth, would you be, do it? And then he said, okay, okay, you made me such a guilty conscience, come to me to Connecticut, for 25 minutes, I will tell you my story about uh, Bello when I met him, and uh, of course later when he took his uh, girlfriend Susan, and then and uh, get out of my house. And so I came to Connecticut to his house, uh, and uh, I met him, and the interview became for. I think almost two hours, and he was talking only about Bello. But this is very also unusual for a writer, <laughs> because fifteen percent of the writers, when you talk about them, they, when you interview them about Bello, they will talk most of the time about themselves. It's okay, this is the people, but he was only talking about uh, uh, Bello. He really was laughing about my accent, my Israeli Jewish accent. He was telling great jokes about it that I couldn't answer. And that's all. A second. We've got uh, interlopers. That's okay. They're, they're also yes, part of the film. This is like free if, uh, the interview with Philip Wong. <laughs> yes. And so there's much more. So you're planning on on putting that yes. putting that whole interview yes. up somewhere. Yes, it will be when after the film will be in American Masters, the all the rushes of the film will be there. All the complete interview with Philip Roth, with uh, 
Salman Rushdie and etc. That sounds that sounds really exciting because it did seem like yeah. like you guys had a, some kind of rapport in some way. Yes, yes, it was a real fun. And later he told me, "Come next year and make a real film about me," because all the other films I was tricking them and they are not good films. He didn't. <laughs> he disliked them. Uh -huh. I don't know. Maybe you know. Maybe they are good. I don't want to say bad words, but he didn't like them. He didn't like them. <laughs> Um, well, because we have a question here that's from the Q&A that's related uh, yeah. to the Philip Roth interview in some way, because he noticed your Israeli accent. So yes. he, the question is, what inspired you as an Israeli filmmaker to make this film about a quintessential American author? So you're, you're an Israeli. What are you doing, you know, doing this film about one of the uh, great American writers? Oh, sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. Say that again. I'm an Israeli, but I'm a Chicago born. I was born <laughs> in Chicago. Oh. <laughs> yes, my father was uh, studying in University of Chicago in, when I was born, and Bella was uh, 78. It was 78, and Bella was the powerhouse, and everybody admired him. And uh, my father told that he saw him, and he was, wow, wow I watched the most important uh, writer in the world and uh, so since then i heard so many great things about bello but really i started to read him when i came and enjoy and understand him when i came to the united states uh, after i met my wife and so I, I grew up in israel and i thought i understand american life i understand everything because i watch uh, Hollywood, I watch television, but really to understand the deep, how structure, the mentality, how it works in United States, I couldn't understand. And for me, Bella was like a guiding book, like for the tourists, but more for the mental to understand the American society. So it was really helpful. He was saving me in the big, <laughs> cities environment uh, so uh, and also when i make the and the third was when i made the film about isaac bashevi zinger and his woman translators the first translators of isaac bashevi zinger was Saul bello and after uh, he translated the gimpel the fool in 53 also the years that the bello won the National Book Award, everybody thought, okay, it's not that Isaac Bashevi Zinger is a great writer, it's that Saul Bello is a great translator because he's a great writer. So Isaac Bashevi Zinger decided to make from this moment to take the translation business to his own Zinger system and to find women, a lot of women translators, some of them that uh, that doesn't uh, know any English and he's like changing with them and tweaking and make his own uh, style of translation. So Bella was a very important uh, figure there. And then I saw there is no a movie about Saul Bella. So this is the last uh, thing that I said, okay, now I will make a movie about it. Yeah, no, uh, it's amazing that there hasn't been one until now, but it makes sense because Saul Bellow both wanted that kind of attention and wouldn't want it. So just a reminder to the audience, uh, to people out there, that it, it is now, I have more questions I could ask, but you're also welcome to enter your questions into the Q&A uh, tab at the bottom of your screen. So please do uh, send in your questions. Um, and while I'll ask another question, but meanwhile, you don't have to pay attention to us while we're talking, you can enter your questions into the chat. Um, into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So um, the next question I have has to do with geography in some sense. This film is sort of concentrates on Chicago, a little bit of New York, but also Vermont. What, what, why was it important for you to have those two locations be prominent? In fact, the Vermont scenes are kind of like um, a chorus or they're sort of, they pop up throughout the whole entire film This coming back to this kind of secluded place where the writing happens. So what, what was the importance of balancing uh, those two places 
as opposed to, right, uh, there's no Montreal, the site of his childhood in this film. There isn't any Eastern Europe where he's, his family is from. There isn't, there isn't that much New York or uh, his trips to Mexico, all the different kinds of Spain, uh, Africa. He went to Africa once, I think, at some point. So what, what made you come? Paris, yeah. 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 Paris is where yeah. he wrote most of uh, Augie March. So what, yes. what motivated you to pick these two sort of anchors for the film? So, of course, Chicago is the most, uh, uh, I think that uh, you compare it to the other places. She is the most dominated the city, the landscape of Bello, also in his books, and uh, especially for this film that I only depict uh, six novels. You know, I didn't uh, depict everything, and not in the novels, I didn't uh, depict every section you know like in Ogi March it's going as you tell to Mexico in the end and uh, I think that also there is a moment that he's in uh, not just in Mexico maybe in another place I think uh, in Florence but uh, so I, I only choose the the moment that uh, Ogi March is in the 30s in Chicago where Bello is coming to Chicago. Yes, I didn't go to Montreal because of course you can find Montreal in some of other uh, novels, but not, not in the novels that are in, the, in these movies. Mm -hmm. yeah, so Vermont, uh, Vermont, uh, it's where Bello is still uh, when I came there and to meet Jenny, say, you can still feel Bello there. You can see his shoes. You can still see his desk. You can still feel that his ghost is there. It's, it's amazing. So this is, was the love line, the, the landscape for Jenny's Bello. And of course, the last book of Wavelstein that is really, this is where the plot is, uh, most of the plot is going on. The discussion between Bello and Bloom. Mm -hmm. And New York was in uh, Humboldt's Gift. Uh, this is where the plot is, most of the plot uh, is going on there. Most, not all, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's some way that geography is tied to his, um, is to his novels. You wanted the geography to tie to his novels. And of course, in that case, um, Chicago is going to loom very, very large, but at the same time, you're trying to trying to sort of capture some kind of progression towards this end in which Vermont becomes a kind of spiritual, I don't know, Eden of some kind almost, where, where you have, where he can commune with his ancestors in a way that, uh, that the noise of Chicago wouldn't allow him to. Um, yes, yeah. also his last years, he was not living in Chicago, he was in Boston, in like mm -hmm. five minutes from where you are, Brookline, mm -hmm. and also there he was more except uh, this big adventure, uh, I think it's for the, for the Bahamas, where he got poisoned, I think later, uh, mm -hmm. it's in uh, Ravelstein, this story. Uh, I think later he was more and more in Vermont. He really loved this quiet, solitary place. Mm -hmm. We have a question here about the final Bellow child. Um, so the youngest daughter's face appears very briefly in the film. Um, how is, what was, what, why, I guess, why is she kind of left out in some way of the film or what, what, what is her sort of representative kind of uh, almost absence in the film might mean this is a question um, from one of the from one of the audience members she don't have a lot of she doesn't have a lot of memories from Bello uh, she he passed away when she was three or four years old and also uh, so, so, so she doesn't have so many memories of good her own father and also I, I don't like to interview uh, <laughs> so I have a child and I'm very sensitive and I don't like to interview people that are 
under age of 18 so because they will always regret about what they are saying <laughs> right so i think that maybe after she will be eight after if i would do the, if i was doing this film uh, when she's over age of 18 maybe i will interview mm -hmm. her but she was around the age of 15 so it's fair. not fair not, that's not fair yeah we have another <laughs> question <so> fair. <laughs> yeah there's a, we have another question about um the bellow children the question is did bell have a close relationship with any of his children or how would you describe that and how did that figure into the film with his first son Greg he lived for 10 years for hmm. nine years until they got uh, uh, until they got uh, separated but uh, Adam Bello uh, so I think that uh, the second wife they separated when Adam was less than one year or so. Of course, he met him, uh, but uh, he was in Chicago. Adam grew up in New York, and they. But later on, when Adam was uh, older and came to study in Chicago, they became close again. But but during when Adam was a kid, it's not a child that you see every day or every weekend. So and. Uh, with Daniel, if they, of course, they were divorced also when Daniel was two, three or four years old, but uh, they still live in the same city, so they have a better connection and uh, they saw each other in the weekends. So it's very complicated, the relationship with uh, three children that, uh, and separating wives and all the tensions. Yeah, um, and there, there is an awkward photo of all of them, I think, at the Nobel Prize banquet or something like that. Yes, I think that this is one of the first times that all of them met together. Right. Because each one of them is from another uh, wife. Uh, so it's not that they're brothers uh, that uh, growing, up, growing up in the same household and fighting for the same attention from their mothers. And uh, most, uh, most of them don't have brothers also uh, from the same, uh, from uh, next marriage. So they've, uh, so, so Bella, when he won, this was the moment, the Nobel Prize that mm -hmm. all of them came together for the, one of the first time. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. um, I guess the sort of, uh... Uh, beginning towards closing questions, but those who have questions can continue asking them. Um, besides the, you know, the the great interview um, with Philip Roth, are there other things that you that didn't make it into the film that you would have wanted to, because of time or, or space? There's things that on the cutting floor that you'd be willing to share with us. There's so many things that are in the cut. There is a whole section about uh, his sh short story, him in his uh, big, uh, him in his foot. In mm -hmm. I forgot the name of him in his foot in his foot in his mouth. Yes. Yes. There is a whole section, like ten great minutes of Daniel Bello is telling, and uh, and uh, it's one of their favorite uh, story of everybody's at an interview and it couldn't enter it was too long mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is will be in the uh, later uh, in the experts from this film mm -hmm. in the extras that come with Extra, the dvd yes <laughs> dvd now it's a website it's easier oh okay <laughs> a whole website just for just for mm -hmm. Saul Bellow extras yeah um, any more questions from the audience? I'm not seeing any other. Yeah. I had the interview with Aleph Bet Yoshua that was uh, in Hebrew that I couldn't, it was too strange to enter mm -hmm. this film. You always told uh, Mr. Zamler, Zamler. 
nobody will understand Zamler and then you see Zamler and what kind of things did he say? Is Saul Bellow a model for him? Aleph Bet Yoshua, for those who don't know, is a very famous uh, Israeli author. Yes, he was teaching in the University of Chicago. And oh. his philosophy is that, that you can only be a real Jew when you are in Israel. Mm -hmm. Saul Bellow was not a real writer because he was not living in Israel. <laughs> Alva Yoshua said this, you have this on camera. Yes, he's like, he has a very pure uh, ideology of what is good and where to live. And so hmm. this is Alva Yoshua and he know how to say these things in a very provocative way. And he's one of the writers that can only talk about himself and say why he's a better writer than Saul Bellow. Okay. No, this is, was yeah. really amazing that Philip Roth didn't do this competition, who is a better writer and just show off and was just talking and praising and also criticize a little bit. But in the good way, uh, analyze Philip Saul Bellow. This is just. It was really like the negative of uh, <laughs> Alf Bet Yoshua was the negative. Well, Alf Bet Yoshua yeah, is sort of, internet. he's sort of channeling Shai Agnon, the famous story, which I'm sure you know about, is Saul Bellow came to Israel and he met with Shai Agnon, the, the Hebrew Nobel Prize winner, for those who don't know yeah. in the audience, an amazing writer, Shai Agnon, the Hebrew, Hebrew writer. And uh, Agnon asked Saul Bellow, uh, you know, have your books been translated into Hebrew? And Saul Bellow, you know, there was a couple translated or there were going to be translated. And said, Agnon said, oh, good, you're safe. Because if, you <laughs> if, if your writing is in Hebrew, then you're safe. If it remains in English, it's worthless, you know, especially, <laughs> especially yeah. when, you know, the, the world to come, especially when the Messiah comes. And Saul Bellow <laughs> laughs this off and, you know, says that, you know, I'm, I, I think I'm assured some kind of universality because of my commitment to writing and to the imagination and to, the, to art. I don't think he realized how serious Shai Agnon was as much as Aleph Bet Yoshua is very serious about this claim. You, you know, you're not, there's nothing, you, your work means nothing unless it's entered into this kind of universal Hebrew register. So I think that's, it's a good way and some interesting way to close our, our conversation because right, maybe Saul Bellow has been secured someplace in the world to come now that he has this film and has it appeared in the Boston Jewish Film Festival. Um, so thank you so much, Asaf. This, this is a great conversation. Oh, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Asaf. And thank you so much, Saul, uh, Saul, for this really fascinating conversation. Um, and thank you all for joining us for uh, our last program on this literary themed day of programming here. Um, just a reminder, you do get a discount at the Brookline Booksmith. So if there are some things, some stories and books that were mentioned in the discussion today or authors, maybe you wanna check them out at the Brookline Booksmith. Um, and you can watch, uh, you can tell your friends to watch The Adventures of Saul Bellow. Um, we have one more week of the uh, virtual film festival. So if your friends have not seen it, still have time to tell them to, uh, uh, to watch it. And um, yeah, thank you all so much and uh, have a good night. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye.